Well, hey, good morning. <clears throat> if you have a Bible, let's go to Nehemiah chapter 9. Nehemiah chapter 9. I want to talk about something um, right off the top that uh, when I tell you, I, I think you're going to go, well, I already know that. I didn't need to come to church to hear that. I, I already, already know that. And, and, I, and I think that's true. I think, I think you already know this. But when it's not in the forefront of your mind, um, it's something that can, if we forget this, um, it really can cause a lot of confusion about why we, 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 we struggle in life and, and why, why is life going the way it's going. And so um, I want to bring it to the forefront of our mind again. And that is this. That is this. It, it is what you believe determines how you behave. What you believe determines how you behave. What you believe to be true determines how you, be you behave in relationships. What you believe uh, to be true determines how you spend your money. What you believe uh, determines how you behave morally. And what you believe determines how you will live your life spiritually, which will determine what happens to you after this life. What you believe determines how you behave. It's, it's like this. Let me just illustrate it this way. It's like... Um, Oftentimes, when a woman looks in a mirror, she is not satisfied with what she sees. She, she looks in the mirror, and she'll, she just will, will be down on herself. Um, I'm this, I'm that, I'm not pretty, I'm this and that, you know, whatever it is. And, uh, and she just, she's just down, just dissatisfied with what she sees in the mirror. And no matter what you say to her, say, hey, you're, you're not that. And she'll say, yes, I am. And you're like, no, you're not. Yes, I am. And you just don't win it because she just believes it. And because she believes it, she'll just spend her life just dissatisfied with, with her life. And she's always going on diets, always doing this, always checking this out. And, and that's just, why does she, because that's what she believes. That's just, it, what you believe determines how you behave. Guys are the opposite, right? Um, guys look in the mirror and go, she is so lucky, right? <laughs> I mean, I, I mean, come on. And because what you believe determines how you behave. But most significantly, what we believe about God will determine how you will live your life. All of us come in here with our own idea of who God is. And the way in which you live your life, the way in which I live my life, reveals what we believe or who we believe God to be who God is. The theologian A.W. Tozer said this. He said that what comes to your mind when you think about God, that's the most important thing about you. What comes to mind when you think about God is the most important thing about you. Why? Because who you believe God to be will play into everything in your life. In Nehemiah chapter 9, what's happening here is these people are becoming reacquainted with this God that, they, that their forefathers, that, that they, have, they have known their entire life, that they, that they have heard about their entire life. But, they, but what has happened over the last 140 years, they have been apart from their city. They've been away from their city. They've been away from their people. They've been away from the temple of God. They've been away from the scripture. And so they, they've lost who it is, who God truly is. And so they're becoming reacquainted. Their city had been destroyed 140 years ago, and their families were all taken into captivity. And by now, in Nehemiah, in Nehemiah, people are beginning to make their way back into the city. By this time, there's about 50,000 people have made, it, made their way back into the city to rebuild the city. Nehemiah is a guy that's living in the king's palace in Persia. He's, he's a Jew, but he's living in Persia. His family was one of those that were taken taken away all those years ago, and he hears about what's going on in, in, in Jerusalem, how it's still a, a wreck, how it's still a mess, and how it is a shame to the glory of God, because what the city is supposed to do, what, what Jerusalem is supposed to do, is supposed to show, like, this is the one true God, and Nehemiah hears that it's still in shambles, and so he makes his way uh, to, to Jerusalem to rally the people to get the city, uh, to get the city built back up, and they start with the walls of the city, because the walls is where their protection was. And they, they, so they build the walls, and so they get the walls around the city, and they finish the walls in 52 days. 
52 days in the middle of a famine, in the midst of the, all of the other nations that are surrounding Jerusalem, coming at them with swords, threatening, threatening war, threatening their life. And so in, in the midst of all of this, in 52 days, they finished this massive project. And now there's, they, go, they all go back home and they spend about five days at home and they're all thinking about what happened. They're all thinking about what, what went on with this wall. Like, how did we finish this wall? And they're thinking about 52 days. We finished this wall and we had this, these people coming at us and this army coming at us and we had we had a famine we're trying to feed our families like how in the world did we get this done in 52 days and it dawned on them the only way that ever happened was because God must have been with us God must have been with us and so they they were at home and in five days after the wall gets built they make their ways they make their way back into the streets of Jerusalem and without prompting they just, they just make their way back into the street of Jerusalem. And they're going, we want to hear from this God. We want to hear from God. So what do you do when you want to hear from God? What do you do when you want? I want to hear a word from God. What do you do? You open up the book. And so they get a guy by the name of Ezra who is an expert in the book, an expert in, in the scripture. And they say, Ezra, you got to bring the book out. You got to bring the, the Bible, the scriptures out and read them to us. And so for six hours on that day, they stood there while Ezra read to them the law. There's Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy. That was their only, that's the scripture that they had. For, that was their Bible in that day. And they just stood, they all stood as Ezra read to them the law. These, 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 these words. I mean, you thought that was long sitting there, right? I mean, they said, for, they stood for, we're like, we're, like, we're not going to have them stand during that. I mean, it's like five minutes long. They stood for six hours just listening to the word of God. And, and all of of a sudden, as they're hearing the scripture, they immediately realize that God's word and God's way does not line up with the way they've been living their life. And so they come back together because something else happened. And they, they also heard when they were, the scripture was being read that it, during the seventh month that there were all of these feasts and festivals and, and these observations that they were supposed to make that, 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 that God had required of his people. And it was the seventh month when they heard the, they heard the word being read. And like, wait a second, we got to get busy. We got to go back. And so they go back home and they, and, they, and they go through all of these feasts and festivals, one of them being the Feast of Booths, where they live outside in their tents uh, for a week just to, to remember what God had done when he brought his people out of Egypt and, and made them a people for himself in Israel. And so they come back together. It's the 25th day of the seventh month, and they come back together. But this time when they come back together, things look a little bit different. In fact, they look a little bit different. They look a lot different. They're wearing something called sackcloth, which I showed you last week is, is essentially burlap. It's this itchy fabric, and they're all wearing it, all like decked out in and sackcloth, and they have dirt sprinkled on their head. And it seems, it seems a bit strange, but here's what they were saying. They were saying that I am aware of the sin that is in my life, and I don't want it. I, they're wearing the sackcloth that is incredibly uncomfortable, but they're going, look, I realize that I've become comfortable in my sin, and I don't want to be comfortable in my sin. I don't want this. And I realize that that my sin, that this is my sin. It has made me, it has made me unclean. And I don't want it. And they stand there for three hours that day. Three hours just confessing, everybody confessing their sin. Well, what is confession? Well, confession is saying, that I agree with you, God, on this. Like, you've called it for what it is, and now I'm coming to terms, and I agree with you uh, that this is sin. When you open the Bible, you got to understand, when you open the Bible, God is the umpire of the Bible. Like, God is the one who calls strikes and balls. Like, he, he, that's, that's him. He, he's the one who calls sin, sin. He, is, he, he calls fornicators, fornicators, and adulterers, adulterers, and gluttons, and sluggards. Like, he just calls it what it is. Confession is saying, this is my sin. I name it, God, what you name it. I'm not justifying it. I'm not, I'm not excusing it. I name it what you name it. I call it what you call it. Confession is not where you let God in on what's going on in your life like he doesn't already know. Confession is not for God. Confession is for you. It's for us. It's, it's us agreeing with God. It's, it's taking our sin. It's dragging it out of the darkness and into the light to say, here it is. This is, this is what I've done. This is, this has been my life. I've been bitter. I've looked at porn. I've been gossiping about this person. We just take our sin and we drag it into the light and say, look, I know it's not pretty, but I don't want it. So here it is. 
I told you last week that confession is, it literally means to cast. It, like it's to cast it toward God. I don't want this anymore. Take it. I don't want it. It's confession. You call it for what it is and you bring it to the light. You don't try to make it sound better than it is. You don't make excuses. You don't blame somebody else. You call your sin for what it is. And when you do, it will cause you to mourn your sin. It will cause you to mourn as you feel the weight of what you've done. And then God can begin to do a change in you. This is what's happening right here in the streets of Jerusalem. For three hours, everybody's just bringing their sin to the light. It's not like we as a people have sin, and so we're just corporately bringing. No, everybody feels the weight of their individual sin, and they're just bringing it to the light and confessing their sin. We'll pick it up in verse 5. And it says, And the Levites and some other Jewish guys said, Stand up and bless the Lord your God from everlasting to everlasting. Blessed be your glorious name, which is exalted above all blessing and praise. These guys, these are the, these are the priests. These are the, the, the leaders in the temple. And they're going, okay, so we've mourned our sin. We've, we've spent some significant time here mourning our sin and confessing our sin. We've brought it out. Now let's stand up and let's bless the Lord. Let's stand up and praise the Lord. In other words, you can't focus on your sin all the time. You, you just, you can't keep your sin before you all the time. When God reveals you your sin, you confess and say, I don't want it. And you repent to say, I'm going to live different. I'm going to live God's way. And then you go, and then you just go do that. You, you, you do that. You, you live God's way. You don't just sit there and, 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 and get in despair and depressed over your sin. You have a place to go with it. Now confess it, repent it, and repent of it and go. You don't sit in shame, despair, hopelessness. You confess, repent, and leave it with God as you pursue his good purpose for your life. Now I, I know it might seem like the humble thing to do is to just say, look, you don't know what I've been. You don't know. I know my sin. My sin is always before me. I, I'm always thinking about my, I, I'm such a wretch. I know that may sound like the humble thing to do. Just keep mourning your sin. But let me tell you, it's actually a form of pride. Because what you're saying in that moment is, I've done something that even though I've confessed it, even though I've repented of it, it's something that is so deep and so, so heavy that I don't think God can fully take care of it. That is pride. And so you confess your sin, you repent of it, and you leave it with God, and you live the life that God has made you to live. You go forward with this life, and you trust him to cleanse you of that sin. The, the Levites are going, okay, now get up. Get up and bless the Lord, not because God needs propping up, but because he is worthy. He is worthy because he is already exalted above everything and above anybody. And what happens next is they pray this prayer. And it, this prayer is the longest recorded prayer in all of the scripture. And they spend this prayer summarizing Everything that they've heard from Scripture. They've, been, they've heard that many of them had never heard Scripture. They had never heard the Scripture read. And so they're, and so they're thinking through everything that, had just been, that they had just heard for all, the, all this, those six hours, that, that initial day, and all this time that they've been studying the, script, the Scripture down and getting their questions answered. And they're getting all the stories right. And they're taking what's been, they, they, they take what in this prayer, they, 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 what they do is they summarize everything that they've ever heard from the Scripture. What's happening in this prayer is they're saying over and over and over and over again, God, this is how our family, this is how our forefathers have sinned against you. But every time they talk about their sin, they talk about God's goodness. Every single time. So here's how we're going to walk through this. What, what, what comes to mind when you think about God is the most important thing about you. So we're going to get some help here on who is this God? Who is this God? In the Bible, in this prayer, the scripture is going to show us <clears throat> who God is. The first thing that we see here is in verse 5. We see here that God is eternal. God is eternal. It says that he is from everlasting to everlasting. He's from everlasting to everlasting. He is eternal. That there was a time when you were not and then a time where you were. It, that, that you, there was a time when you had a beginning. But you cannot say that about God. 
God has, there's never been a, be, a beginning for God. He has always been. Before there was an earth, before there was a universe, before there was even angels, there was God. He has always been. He is eternal, from everlasting to everlasting. He is not bound or limited by time. God is eternal. But not only is he eternal, also God is the only God. This is what they say in verse 6, as you are the Lord, you alone. You are the Lord, you alone. There is no other God but God. He is the one great God. We're not choosing this God over all the other gods. He is the only God. He is the one great God. You are the Lord, you alone. You have made the heaven, the heaven of heavens, with all their hosts, the earth and all that is in it, the seas and all that is in them. God is not only the only God, but he, God is our creator. God is our creator. God is the creator of the heavens, of the universe. God is our creator. He's the creator of life. He created you. He put you together. He's the one who made us. So he, better than anybody, he knows how your life goes. He knows how you were made, how your life was made to go. Like he knows your, the ins and outs of your life. He better than anyone knows how your life works. He knows that the, the purpose for your life is found in him. He knows you. He's not oblivious to your life. He's not oblivious to what's going on right now in your life and how it's going, how it's meant to be lived. Pur purpose and meaning and joy in your life is found in him. Living life the way God created your life to go. God is our creator, and it says, and you preserve all of them. You made all of this, and you preserve all of them. God sustains. God sustains, which means that God will preserve your life until he has fulfilled his purpose in your life. God will preserve your life until he has fulfilled his purpose in your life. There is nothing that, you, that can take you out until God says it's time. Some of you, you think about back over your life, and there have been times that you should have died. Like you think about some of the, th the things that you went that you should have died, and yet here you are. Some of you, you should be divorced, and yet here you are. Some of you, you should be filled with hopelessness and despair, and yet here you are. God is the sustainer. He, is, he sustains. And it says, in the host of heaven worships you. The host of heaven worships you. God is worshiped by the angels. God is worshiped by the angels. God is the, the king of the universe. He, the scripture tells us that Jesus is the risen king. He's the, he's the king that is seated on the throne and he is now being worshiped by the angels. All powers and authority are subject to him. Now, listen, I know it can seem as though there are other powers at work having their way in your life and in this world. It seems, like, it seems like culture, it seems like the media, even, even your friends, even your peers, it seems like they are the ones that are kind of running things in your life right now. But Jesus is king. All authorities, all powers submit to Jesus. Jesus, right now, he hears your prayers. He is saving people. He is ruling and reigning. He is working out his will. And one day, your boss or whoever it is, your enemies, the ones who mock you for following Jesus, one day they will see Jesus and they will worship Jesus as well. Jesus is, or God is worshiped by the angels. And in verse seven it says, you are the Lord, the God who chose Abram and brought him out of Ur, the Chaldeans, and gave him the name Abraham. God is, God is the creator. He is the only God. He is worshiped by the angels, but God is the God who comes near. He's the God who comes near. He is not a far-off being. He's the king of the universe, but he's close. He's personal. He doesn't sit outside of creation. He's near. He knows you. He knows your name. He is involved in the smallest details of your life. It says, you found his heart faithful before you, and made with him the covenant to give to his offspring the land of the Canaanite, the Hittite, the Amorite, and the Perizzite, and the Jebusite, and the, and the Girgashite. And you have kept your promise, for you are righteous. God is the God who comes near, but God is also the God who is faithful. 
God made an unconditional covenant with Abraham. God told Abraham that I'm going to make a nation out of you. Abraham had no children. He was old and had no children. And he says, through your offspring, I'm going to have a nation that's going to belong to me. Through your offspring. And I'm going to give you as many offspring as the stars. And he would give him a land to have for his family that would be a nation. And typically what happens when there was a covenant made in that day, there a covenant between two parties, what they would do is they would take an animal and they would sacrifice the animal. They would cut it in two and they would lay it on the ground. And then the two parties would walk together to confirm this covenant, to ratify this covenant. They would walk together through the, uh, through the animals. And, this, and, and, and it was a way to say, I, I, I'm saying that I'm going to keep my end and I'm going to keep my end. And, and he, he, both parties were, were saying, okay, I'm in on this. But that's not what happened with Abraham. With Abraham, they, the animal was sacrificed and it was laid, laid on the ground. But then what happens is fire comes from heaven and goes between the animals without Abraham. If this was God coming down and, and walking through, walking through the, the animal, the sacrifice on his own to say that, that I'm going to fulfill this covenant no matter what you do, Abraham. It, I'm, I'm going to fulfill it, your sin, it, your rebellion will not overtake God's faithfulness. Ultimately, this wasn't, though, just a covenant that God made with Abraham, but it's for all that would come through his family. This is who God is. He is faithful. Politicians will break their promises. Husbands and wives will break their promises. But God keeps his promises. If you have confessed Jesus as your Savior and your King, then you need to know You are an adopted son, an adopted daughter of God. Your sins have been paid for by the sacrifice of Jesus. You will one day see Jesus. You will one day be raised to live for eternity on this earth, and you will reign and rule with Jesus. God keeps his promises. He will never leave you. He will never abandon you. He is faithful. And he he keeps his promises because this is who he is. It says, For you are righteous, that God is righteous, that God only ever does what is right. God only ever does what is good. This is just who he is. And he says, and you saw the affliction of your fathers in Egypt, and you heard their cry at the Red Sea, and performed signs and wonders against Pharaoh and all his servants and all the people of this land. For you knew that they had acted arrogantly against our fathers, and you made a name for yourself as it is to this day. God is glorious. God is glorious. There is no name greater than God's name. Israel was enslaved to Pharaoh and the Egyptians. Egypt was essentially the the ruler of the the known world. And they gave no no mind. They paid no attention to to the God of the slave, of their slaves, the Israelites. They gave no thought to the God of Israel. Then God brings plagues to Egypt. You remember it. You remember the story. Maybe you've you've seen it somewhere. Maybe you've read it or you heard it in Sunday school when you were a kid. But you remember the story that they're crying out to God, to their God, to a God that Egypt does not recognize. And they're crying out, we need help. We want want out of here. For 400 years, they're crying out to God. God hears their cries, and he brings plagues. He brings, he brings frogs, and, 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 and he brings, uh, 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 turns the water in, into blood, and, and, he just, and he brings flies. I mean, he just brings one plague after another, and he shows up, and all, and all of a sudden, Pharaoh says, all right, get out of here. And, and all of, when they didn't recognize the God of Israel, now everybody in Egypt knew who the God of Israel was because God made a name for himself. Everyone today, 2024, is trying to make a name for themselves. Everybody, everybody's trying to make a name for themselves. The number one career goal for Gen Z, the number one, is to be a social media influencer. That's it. I had no idea what that was. Like, you had told me that when I was in sixth grade. Like, hey, what do you want to be when you grow up? I'm like, I said doctor because I thought they made a lot of money. But I don't like the sight of blood, so I figured that wasn't going to work out. But, but I'm like, 
<laughs> like social media influencer. Um, but that is, that, is, that is number one by far amongst Gen Z. Everybody wants to make a name for themselves. But there is only one name under heaven by which we can be saved. There is only one name that we will be talking about 2,000 years from now. And that is the name of Jesus. The name that God has made above every other name. That, the, that one day at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that this Jesus, he is king. He is the Lord. It says, and you divided the sea, verse 11, before them. So that they went through the midst of the sea on dry land, and you cast their pursuers into the depths as a stone into mighty waters. God is our defender. God says that vengeance is mine. When you have faced injustice, when you have been hurt, when you have been sinned against, you can entrust justice to God. God will defend you. He will see to it that there is justice for the evil that was done to you. It will either be paid for by Jesus on the cross if they have repented of their sin, or it will be paid for them, paid for by them in hell. One way or the other, justice will be served. God is our defender. You can trust him. By a pillar of cloud, verse 12, you led them in, this, in the day and by a pillar of fire in the night to light for them the way in which they should go. God is the miraculous way maker. He is the miraculous way maker. God hears the cries of his people, and for the sake of his own name, he makes a way for his people. That he still answers prayer. He still heals the sick. He still does the unexplainable. He still makes a way where there is no way. And God is our guide. He is our guide. God will lead you in the way that you should go. He gives his sons and his daughters the Holy Spirit to lead us. You can trust him. You can trust him with all of your heart. That you don't need to lean on your own understanding. He is guiding you. He is leading you for his, for his glory and for your good. It says in 13, you came down on Mount Sinai and spoke with them from heaven and gave them right rules and true laws, good statutes and commandments. And you made known to them your holy Sabbath and commanded them commandments and statutes and, and the law by Moses, your servant. He gave them bread from heaven for their hunger and brought water for them out of the rock for their thirst. And you told them to go and to, and to possess the land. He is the one who is the rightful judge. He is the one who gave us these laws and commandments, his word. Therefore, he is the one who says, this is how I created life to go. Therefore, he is the rightful judge. He is holy and he is righteous and his standard is holiness and righteousness. Listen, I know you know who you are when no one is looking. Like you know who you are when the lights go out. And God knows who you are when no one's looking and the lights go out. And he judges your life and my life based upon his holiness, based upon his righteousness. It says, but they and our fathers, they acted presumptuously and stiffened their neck and did not obey your commandments. When it says that our fathers acted presumptuously, what he's saying is that even though they were living in rebellion against God's ways, they expected that God should bless them. That's how they lived their life. They had, they had an excuse for their sin. The God would say, You're, God would point to their sin and they say, yeah, but that's because of this. That's because of what they did. They would excuse their sin. They would justify their sin. They, they had an excuse for everything, and they simply thought that God owed them something, no matter what they did. And it says, and they stiffened their neck. It's, it's the picture of trying to put a yoke on an untrained oxen. You know, they, they, put, uh, they put a yoke on ox, or on, on like a pair of oxen, or, or a team of oxen, and so that they would travel together, that they would be led together. They would go in the same direction of the, the, the way in which the owner says, I want you to go. And so you put the yoke on the oxen so the oxen can be, oxen can be led. But if an, if an oxen doesn't want to be led by its owner, it will stiffen its neck to keep the yoke off. This is what they were doing. They were set in doing what they wanted to do. I know what God said, but I'm, I'm going to do what I'm going to do. 
I know, I know what God I know what his law says. I know what his word says, but I'm going to do what I wanted, refusing to go the way that God was leading them. It says they refused to obey and were not mindful of the wonders that you performed among them. They were so blind in their sin that they could not see all of the miraculous ways that God was providing for them. And it says, it says, but they stiffened their neck and appointed a leader to return to their slavery in Egypt. This is how blind they were. They, they, they couldn't see the way God had provided for them and even began to believe that their lives were better if they were just go back into Egypt and become slaves again. God had rescued them from 400 years of being treated like animals in Egypt. They had no identity. They had no land. They had no nation to belong to. And God miraculously rescues them out, makes them a people, leads them to a land that will be theirs. And what do they want? They want to be slaves again. Why? Because sin makes you stupid. That's why. You want to live a miserable life you want to lose your faith in God, lose hope for your life, then forget about all the ways that God has shown up in your life. Just forget what God had rescued you from. And it won't be long before you will resent the God who rescued you. He says, they say, but you are a God ready to forgive gracious and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and did not forsake them. I don't know. You, you read these stories and you're like, why, why didn't God just, like, just destroy them? Why, why didn't God just say, okay, you want to go back? Just go back. I'll find somebody else. Why didn't God just let them go because of who he is? And who is he? God is a God who forgives God is a God who forgives, perhaps more, more miraculous than parting the sea and bringing bread from heaven every morning and leading them with a the cloud and fire. Perhaps the, most, the, the greatest miracle of all was when they turned their back on God, God was ready to forgive. And he was willing to allow the things of their past to never count against their relationship with him. God forgives and God is gracious. God is gracious, meaning he gives good to those who do not deserve good. And God is merciful that he withholds justice to those who deserve justice. People like us. And God is slow to anger. He is patient. He knows your condition. He knows your sinful nature. He knows your fight with sin. And he is patient. He is not willing that any should perish, but, all would, but that all would come to repentance. And God is abounding in steadfast love. That once he sets his love on you, it just goes on. Once God sets his love on you, it never quits. It never quits. When you rebel and you sin, he will pursue you. And he'll bring whatever he needs to bring your life to your life to bring you back to the life that you were meant to live. He loves you too much to allow you to stay where you are. And God has shown himself gracious and he's shown himself merciful and abounding in steadfast love to us. Has he not? I mean, you think about what your life would be had God not stepped in and saved you. You think about what God has saved you from, how patient he has been, how merciful to not give you what you deserve, and how gracious to give you so much more than you deserve. This is who God is. It's not just what he does. It's who he is. It says, even when they had made for themselves a golden calf and said, this is your God. Can you, can you believe it? After all they had seen God do, they put this golden calf together, and then they all say, this is the God who rescued you. This, this is your God who brought you out of Egypt and had committed great blasphemies. You and your great mercies did not forsake them in the wilderness 
The pillar of cloud to lead them in the, in the way did not depart from them by day, nor the pillar of fire by night to light, the, light for them the way by which they should go. You gave your good spirit to instruct them. You gave your good spirit because God is spirit. God is spirit. This is the spirit that fills every believer when God saves you. God himself dwells within every believer, bringing comfort when you're broken, bringing conviction when you're sinful, and empowers you to say no to sin and say yes to the way of Jesus. But even better than that, this is the spirit that changes your desires to where you begin going, I want to say no to sin, and I want to say yes to Jesus. God's spirit is within you, follower of Jesus, which means that God is with you right now. He is not abandon you. 21, 40 40 years you sustained them in the wilderness and they lacked nothing. Their clothes did not wear out and their feet did not swell. And you gave them kingdoms and peoples and allotted to them every every corner. So they took possession of the land of Sion, king of Heshbon, and the land of Og, king of Bashan. You multiplied their children as the stars of heaven and you brought them into the land you had told their fathers to enter and possess. God multiplied their children. God made them a people. He multiplied their children. That's because God is the life giver. God is the life giver, the child maker. God is the one who puts life in the womb. He is the giver of life. Where God has put a life, we have no right to destroy that life. You say, why you got to get political? I'm not, it's not political. It's the Bible. God says in Proverbs chapter 8, says, all who hate me love death. All who hate God love death. We are pro-life because God is pro-life. God is the life giver. He says, so the descendants went in and possessed the land, and you subdued before them the inhabitants of the land, the Canaanites, and gave them into their hand with their kings and the people of the land that they might do with them as they would. And they captured fortified cities in a rich land and took possessions of houses full of all good things, cisterns already hewn, vineyards, olive orchards, fruit trees in abundance. So they ate and were filled and became fat and delighted themselves in your great goodness. Nevertheless, they were disobedient and rebelled against you and cast your law behind their back and killed your prophets who had warned them in order to, return, to turn them back to you, and they committed great blasphemies. Therefore, you gave them into the hand of their enemies who made them suffer. He provides for them. He, he gives them food and, and land and a family and a life to enjoy, and they again turn away from God. And God sends prophets to them to say, hey, wake up. Look what you're doing. You're turning away from the God who loves you, the God who provided for you, like this God who is, who is sustaining your life, gave you this land, gave you all these good things. And you're turning away from him, and they kill the prophets. And so what does God do? Well, he does what a good father does who, to those who whose children he loves, and he, he disciplines because God is a disciplining father. God is a disciplining father because the truth is if God doesn't intervene, if God doesn't get our attention with some sort of pain or hardship, then we will never know, and we will eventually be destroyed. Let me ask you, when you were sick, when you are in physical pain, have you ever considered that that personal sin could be the source? When you experience tension in your closest relationships, have you ever considered that your sin could be the source of that tension? And not, it's not your spouse, it's not your child, it's not your mom, it's not your dad. When your family begins to fall apart, your marriage is spiraling, your kids go off the rails, have you ever considered that it could be a result of some sin in your life? And maybe not sin toward that person. Oftentimes you open yourself up to sin in an area of your life, and before you know it, it affects all areas of your life. Your relationships are just not the same. When you're in despair, when you are depressed, when you feel God is a million miles away, have you ever considered that it could be that your sin, your personal sin, is the source of the problem? 
It's certainly not always the reason for sickness and depression and hard times. But when hard times hit, it's a time when we should come to God and ask, is there sin here? Is this what's behind this? Is there there personal sin here in my life? Because God's love is steadfast, he will do what it takes to wake you up to the life that he created you to live, the life that is for your greatest joy. He goes on. No, they go on. It says, In the time of their suffering, they cried out to you, and you heard them from heaven, and according to your great mercies, you gave them saviors who saved them from the land or from the hand of their enemies. But after they had rest, they did evil again before you, and you abandoned them to the hand of their enemies so that they had dominion over them. Yet when they turned and cried to you, you heard from heaven, and many times, many times you delivered them according to your mercies. And you warned them in order to turn them back to your law, yet they acted presumptuously and did not obey your commandments, but sinned against your rules, which if a person does them, he shall live by them. And they turned a stubborn shoulder and stiffened their neck and would not obey. Many years you bore with them and warned them by your spirit through your prophets, Yet they would not give ear. Therefore, you gave them into the hands of the, of the peoples of the lands. Nevertheless, in your great mercies, you did not make an end to them or forsake them. For you are a gracious and merciful God. Over and over again, they were unfaithful. And he was faithful. They were in trouble because of their own rebellion And God delivered them. And isn't that the story of your life and my life? That I am unfaithful and he is faithful. I am prone to wonder and he pursues. I make a mess of things and he forgives. He rescues. He restores. Because God is a constant savior. He is a constant Savior. For those of you who have wandered off again and again and again and again, and you wonder, is God is he just fed up with me? Is he sick of me? Is he done with me? Have I gone too far? Am I unreachable? So if those are the questions that you're asking, because your desire is to be reconciled with God, then I can tell you, I guarantee you that the answer is no. That he is not done with you. He is not sick of you. You have not gone too far. You are not outside of his reach. God's hand is not too short that he cannot save you. God has a history of faithfulness to show that he has not left you. He has not abandoned you. This is what the Jews are saying here. They just get, they're just going, this is our story. It's just it, Our story is that God is good to Israel. Israel sins and God shows mercy. God is good to Israel, Israel sins, and God shows mercy. And so what they're saying, what's behind this prayer is what they're saying is, God, would you just do it one more time? Would you do it again? He says, now therefore, in verse 32, now therefore our God, the great, the mighty, and the awesome God who keeps covenant and steadfast love, let let not all the hardships seem little to you that has come upon us. Upon our kings, our our princes, our priests, our prophets, our fathers, and all your people since the time of the kings of Assyria until this day. Yet you have been righteous in all that has come upon us, for you have dealt faithfully and we have acted wickedly. They're going, God, we now realize that the reason that we have spent the last 140 years in captivity and the reason that our city was destroyed and the reason that we even today are controlled and enslaved by Persia is because of our own sin. And we're asking you to do what you've always done, God. Would you be merciful to us and would you forgive us and would you deliver us? Listen, if you could identify with Israel today as they're standing there in the streets crying out to God, they've made confession of their sin and asking God, would you deliver us? Would you forgive me? Would you put your hand on our life? If you can identify with 
With this prayer today, you have wandered from God. You feel the weight of your sin. And perhaps you wonder, have I gone too far? Have I exhausted the mercy and the forgiveness of God? But you want your life to bless God. You want your life to to, to praise God. Listen, if that's you, here's what you do. You remember all of God's goodness to you. And then you confess all of your sins. You bring them all out into the light. You own up to all of it. And then you remember that God is a God of mercy and grace. And grace upon grace upon grace upon grace. And then you cry out to God and say, God, would you just give me more of that? Would you give me more mercy? Would you give me more grace? And here's what you will find. You will find mercy and grace. How do I know? How do I know that he will not just take his wrath out upon you? Because God poured all of his wrath for your sin on Jesus. How do I know that he will not abandon you? Because God abandoned Jesus so that you would not be abandoned. Why did he do this? Because God is a God of mercy and grace and steadfast love. So where you have sin, get on your knees before God and mourn your sin. Confess your sin. Own it and let it be known. And repent. Leave your sinful ways and live God's way. And then get up off your knees and stand up and praise God for who he is and for what he's done.